Well, my name is Tracy O'Shaughnessy. I'm a columnist with the Republican American. I also cover the visual arts. Um, but today, thanks to Bridget Grady, I feel as though I'm going to the junior prom. <laughs> and um, I have um, some prepared remarks. I'm very delighted to be here. I've been in this space a number of times to review things and to talk with Bridget. And it's always a delight for me as somebody who really doesn't practice art uh, to be in a space where people who are so very talented um, can share their talent with the rest of us. So the um, program, such as it is, will go in the following way. Uh, I will talk to you from my prepared remarks, and what my hope is is that you uh, will ask me oodles of questions because I am always on the other side of asking the questions, and it might be nice to be uh, somebody who has to actually answer them. Um, a nice turn of, of the tables. So, about two years ago, a searing knife-like pain in my abdomen sent me hurtling to the nearest hospital by the time my husband completed that seven-mile journey, the pain was so intense that I was unable to speak beyond a single word, help. Although I did not know it, I was in the throes of the agony that comes from an unusual and life-threatening emergency. My intestines had twisted upon themselves like ribbons coiling around a maypole. My innards were being strangled. Fortunately for me, I had arrived in sufficient time for doctors to slice me open and correct the problem. A volvulus, I was told later, is a rather simple surgical fix. Cut it out and stitch it up. But in the weeks and days that followed, as I vacillated between feelings of relief that the crisis had been averted, and terror over how near to catastrophe I had come. A single image kept materializing in my mind. The image was Giotto's The Visitation, an early 14th century depiction of the moment as, when, as related by Luke. The Virgin Mary pregnant with Jesus, goes to visit her cousin Elizabeth, who is herself pregnant with John the Baptist. Why this image, or any artistic image, would cleave to me post-surgically was a mystery I could not unravel any more than I could stop the Giotto from coming to mind. It was as ineradicable as it was enigmatic. It was not the first time that an image would stay with me like the scent of a woman's perfume, but I had understood the reasons other works had stayed with me. This persistence left me baffled. It wasn't until I zeroed in on the very aspect of the work that fixated me, that I began to understand the persistence of the image. What got me was the gaze. What got me was how the women looked at one another. It is the locked, intimate gaze of two women linked by spirit, by destiny, by mutual understanding. Mary looked at Elizabeth, and in an instant, Elizabeth got it. She got it. In the story, Mary not only knows who she is carrying, but knows he will meet a violent end, just 
as Elizabeth knows her son will meet a similar fate. The two women are the only ones on earth who can understand the joy and anguish that will be theirs alone. They get each other. And that's what we look for in life, really. Not to be separate from one another, but to be understood, emotionally embraced on a level that transcends thought. Giotto captured this spiritual simpatico. And when I understood that, I understood what I needed. I wanted someone to understand. I wanted someone to get it. I wonder if we all have moments like that. Not moments where we feel misunderstood and hungry for empathy, which is, in many respects, part of the human condition, but moments where what we feel cannot be encapsulated by the hard precision of words, but is best articulated by something beyond words, something that we see. Art fills in those interstices. How many of us, for instance, have felt that the world is not the reliable linear compass that we pre pretend it to be? This leads to this leads to that. But instead, an arresting and sometimes frightening collision of reality and imagination, the logical and the absurd. How many of us have seen the long lozenge-like planes of Mark Rothko and sensed that we have been there in the honeyed sunset of a drawing day or the bleak, inky, black, tar of a despairing mood that will not lift. You can say all you will about art elevating our senses and exhilarating our public discourse, about it enlivening our public spaces, about it feeding our spirit. But I think that the best art begins where words leave off. The best art enunciates the ineffable, the ineffable qualities about living, about what it is to be a soul in an all too material world. I like to tell people that when I began reporting on art about a dozen years ago, about all I knew was that Renoir painted dogs and that Mary Cassatt made the best Mother's Day cards. That wasn't expressly true exactly. I had a better than average understanding of art that comes standard in all French majors. I could tell a Degas from a de Kooning. I could tell a Gainsborough from a Van Gogh. But much of what I needed to learn would come from seeing. Much of what I needed to say about art was leaving myself open to the distinct possibility that what I knew was nothing at all. Fortunately, finding oneself unprepared for one's task is not unusual in journalism. Reporters are forever being thrust into some arcane maelstrom or other that they must assess, decipher, critique, and resolve in all the time it takes to make a king-size bed. But I didn't want to do that with art, because in spite of my professed ignorance, I didn't think art deserved it. Art deserved better than my understanding of it, and that required two indispensable attributes from me. One was curiosity, and the other was humility. I don't pretend to be Michael Kimmelman of the New York Times or Blake 
Gopnik of Newsweek. These are art critics of unique focus and uncommon eloquence. I am a reporter for a medium-sized weekly or daily newspaper, sharing with my readers some of the jolts and insight I receive from an artwork too breezily dismissed from media outlets content to assuage their journalistic guilt with a four-column photograph and a two-sentence caption. The visual arts, like music or dance, have largely been excised from newspapers like mine. Their owners are certain in their presumptions that what readers want is more television news, more celebrity squibs, more nonsense about purveyors of nonsense. And it is through this calculus that we all become smaller. I do not pretend expertise in my area, but I do keep with me these virtues of humility and curiosity. Humility in the face of a Caravaggio is easy to come by, particularly from someone as aesthetically inept as I am. How can you not stare and gape at the pained, disillusioned look of abandonment that crosses Jesus' face in despair over his betrayal by his friend, Judas. Religion aside, who has not been betrayed by a friend? Who has not felt that poisonous mix of disbelief and rage? But many cannot. Many are unable. Many, too many, are unmoved. I often wonder whether we do not always know what we are feeling or why, because we never really have put ourselves in the position of being in front of a piece of art that might elicit the very emotion that we are at pains to name. When I began to tackle the art beat, I drew strength from something I learned a long time ago by a teenage piano prodigy whom I interviewed for a weekly community newspaper. My subject was soon to be off to Juilliard, and she was going to have a bright and auspicious future. I asked her a rather standard question that I asked of these young wonderkins, which was whether she believed her proficiency in the piano was a gift. She shook her head. No... She said, it's not the playing that's a gift. It's the ability to appreciate the music that's the real gift. The comment struck me as insightful from such a young subject, underlying the inevitability that her future was going to be more brilliant than any I could hope for. But really, unless you understood and loved Bach, it was impossible to say it was a gift to play him well. If you couldn't swoon over Mozart, all the digital dexterity in the world would never compensate. It was the ability to fall in love with beauty that was the most precious gift. It was the ability to marvel. Appreciation is one of those banal, platitudinous words that gets invoked in greeting cards, gut academic courses, and clumsy expressions of gratitude. It's too bad because it's been diffused of all its vitality. It seems facile and obvious. But being able to appreciate beauty, in this case art, is not as reflexive as we'd like to imagine. It requires a quality that many in this postmodern, archly ironic age seem to lack. It requires awe. The Greeks believed that to wonder is the first step 
toward wisdom. But many of us in this been there, done that, kind of tweets, jab, slow-mo, fast-forward, delete age, have lost that ability. We've lost that capacity to wonder. And without it, we cannot see. Without it, we are blind, feeling in the dark for some kind of transcendence that continues to elude us. Years ago, I was lucky enough to attend a recital by the soprano Kiri Takanawa at the Kennedy Center in Washington, D.C. Seats were hard to come by, and so I was only awarded one ticket by the press officer, and so I went alone in my single seat, then knowing very little of Takanawa and even less of Strauss. And all alone in my single seat, I heard music come out of Takanawa that I never before imagined could have emerged from a human mouth. I realized in my oral enchantment that I had thought a lot of what God looked like or what he felt like. But never until that moment had I imagined what he might sound like and when I listened to Takanawa, I knew art had filled my sensory gap. We are fed by food. Liquid nourishes our thirst. But what quells our yearning for beauty? What, for that matter, sates our appetite for ugliness? Because surely, as a violent world attests, we have that craving too. But I don't believe that we give artistic hunger sufficient attention. It is, I suspect, like a spiritual hunger that we sate with empty promises and ephemeral illusions. After a while, like most hunger, it becomes so much a part of us that we hardly notice. 2,000 years ago, Pontius Pilate snidely asked a young Upstart, what is truth? And from at least that point on, we've continued to wrestle with the question. Perhaps one of the most endearing qualities of art to me as an interested observer is that Pilate's question is the very riddle with which art tussles too. Art, of course, is not truth, and as Picasso reminds us, it is the lie that makes us realize truth. And like truth, art comes hurtling toward us, destabilizing us in ways that confound our certainties and threaten our convictions. It assaults us, addles us, and astonishes us. I remember standing in front of George Stubbs' massive horse attacked by a lion in Library Court of the British Art Center. If you haven't seen it, please do. It's a big and pretty grisly scene. A lion leaps out of the wilderness and gouges its teeth into the glorious butterscotch hide of a fleeing horse. I could not move away from this painting, and I could not discern what it was about it that was keeping me transfixed. It came to me in my sympathy for the wounded horse that this dynamic battle between wildness and domestication, ferocity and docility was, in a sense, my battle. The battle between discipline and rapacity, the visceral and the cerebral, the savage and the tame. It is, in a sense, the battle of all of us in the civilized world. Stubbs captured it in this bloodthirsty homage to two beasts in a struggle that would leave one of them dead and one of them sated. So here was an expression of truth from an unlikely source. But I have found it too in the abstract emotiveness of Hugh O'Donnell, in the fiery poetry of Miro, in the shattering juxtapositions of Dali, and in the superhuman grace of Fra Angelico. I had never thought too very much about the way 
we try to contain and organize and make sense of the flotsam and the detritus of our lives until I looked at a Joseph Cornell box. I had never considered what it was to see a whole life, an entire era, dematerialize before my eyes until I found Turner. I had never known, really known, what it was to grieve until I saw Rembrandt's last self-portrait. The stupid believe that to be truthful is easy, Willa Cather wrote. Only the artist, the great artist, knows how difficult it is. I often have to remind myself that what I'm looking at is marble or paint or clay. I have to shake myself to recall that what I'm looking at is deception that looks very much like truth. But deception in service to truth is only a parable by another name. As Magritte said, art evokes the mystery without which the world would not exist. And if that shakes up our world, so much the better. Imagine the wonder of having beauty, real beauty, land smack in front of you. You could hardly blame yourself for chasing after it the rest of your life. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>